when he turned his back from shoulder to shoulder it looked like as wide as the tailgate of a truck and this darkness literal darkness just came like all over just just all over me except where i was standing this thing let out the most blood curdling mind blowing spine tingling scream that you've ever heard in your life and it cut through me like a knife and I knew that they were going to take me. I just knew it. And then the next thing I can remember is being levitated. Well, when I look in there, uh, I see two big eyes staring back at me. Hello and welcome. You're listening to The Bump Podcast, a place for the believers of the unexplained, monsters, and paranormal. Join us, and we'll go face-to-face -face with what goes bump in the night. Um, hi, Bo. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Joyce Robertson, and I live up near Man with my husband, Jack, of over 50 years. <laughs> and I have two children, Michelle Akers from Logan, uh, who's married to Chad. They have two children, Jackson and Connor. And my other daughter, Eric, the daughter, lives in uh, Williamstown. Her name is Amy Isley, and she's married to Bill, and they have two children, Taylor and Cruz. And I am a member of the board of directors of the Arcoma Story Incorporated. And um, in 2014, I wrote a play called Mamie. And um, it's since been produced twice by the Arcoma Story. And we had very good, very good uh, attendance and good remarks made about it. I'm very proud of it. It's based on, it's inspired by true events, and it's based on a lady named Mamie Thurman. And she was an attractive 31-year-old woman who, um, during the day, was considered a respectable lady. She was kind of a, a woman of the modern days in 1931. She actually worked outside the home. She worked at a car dealership for a while. She worked at a bank for a while. Um, while she worked at the bank, that's probably where she met Harry Robertson, who was a bookkeeper at the bank and ended up being her landlord and her lover. Hmm. Um, she was married um, to uh, Jack Thurman, who was a city patrolman. But Mamie, in June of 1932, was murdered and her body was found beside of the road on Trace Mountain, or 22 Holden, as a lot of people call it. And she had been, her throat had been slashed from ear to ear. She had been shot in the head, on the left side of the head, two times, and her neck was broken. She had, they found her purse, which had money, jewelry. And robbery was not the motive, in other words. And she was cruelly murdered. Um, she was considered respectable during the day. Um, she went to the woman's club. She went to church. She played golf. But in the evening, she was a different personality. <laughs> um, she was, in reality, a party girl, I guess you could call her. She um, frequented several places in Logan that the good ladies of Logan probably wouldn't have gone to while her husband was at work. Um, Harry Robertson, as I said, was her landlord. She and her husband Jack lived in an attic apartment above the garage that Louise and Harry Robertson owned. And that was situated where the uh, LBNT drive through is now is where their home was. That's kind of an interesting thing, I think. But um, I'm sure the rent wasn't very much, if you get my drift. And Harry Robertson is rumored to have helped Jack Thurman get a job because Harry, not only was he a bookkeeper at the bank, 
he was also, um, I think, treasurer of the library, but he was also president of the Logan City Commission. So he had some pull there. Um, Louise was just, his wife was a um, homemaker, had two children, but she was like a volunteer in the community and played golf. She was a um, respected Logan lady. Um, their home was nice and it was larger than most. So they had a boarder. His name was Oscar Townsend. And he also worked at the bank where Harry worked. And they also had a handyman who lived there for room and board and just did odd jobs. Uh, he drove the car, uh, washed the dishes for Louise, um, took care of the dogs. Harry was a big fox hunter, an avid fox hunter. And Clarence Stevenson, his handyman, drove the car for him, took him hunting and helped him, took care of the dogs. Clarence was a short stature, very short statured man um, who had been injured in two separate coal mining accidents. He had missing fingers on both hands and he had a terrible head injury which caused his nose to bleed just on just any time. He would just have instant nosebleeds. Um, and uh, he lived in the attic of the Robertson home. He used the basement of their home to shave and clean up and everything. Um, but he was a black man. So when he had to use the bathroom, he had to travel to the courthouse, the Logan courthouse oh, wow. to use the bathroom. Now that's an important point because on the night that Manny was murdered, of which he was arrested for, he was ill. He had a stomach ailment and the doctor had put him on some kind of a strong medication that caused him to have to go to the bathroom often. So he would, at home, he was at home and then he would have to go all the way over a block away, use the bathroom, then he would come back home. So the man was short, small, sick, and he was a good guy in other words. So when he got arrested, he and Harry both got arrested for her murder. And Harry was eventually released, but Clarence, of course, as we know, went to jail. The day she was murdered, um, Mamie, well, first Jack, her husband, left for work. He worked the night shift in Logan as a city patrolman. And he left for work around 5.30, something like that. And she left then shortly after, probably 30 to minutes to an hour later, she left. And she was seen in a couple of places around town, but the last time anyone saw her was around nine o'clock. Louise testified at the trial that Harry had gone to work that day, came home, took their two children to Stallings to go swimming, and then brought them home and took his car, drove his car around the block, parked it in the garage, and then came home and proceeded to watch the fights or listen, I'm sorry, listen to the fights. There was no television back then, but boxing was a big deal, I guess, a popular thing. Anyway, Oscar Townsend and Harry watched or listened to the fights. Uh, Louise in the living room, Louise was in the dining room and Clarence came in partially, partially through and listened to some of the fights. And then after that, they all went to bed. So, and like I said, Clarence was ill. So he, he had been in and out of the house. But Louise testified that she heard Clarence go upstairs. I think it's about 1130 that night to his attic apartment. Um, uh, Harry was a, also not just a bank, bookkeeper at the bank or Logan City Commission president and avid fox hunter. He was also uh, had a key to the uh, local speakeasy, mm. the Kit Kat Club. <laughs> and um, that was located above the G.C. Murphy building. You're, you may, you know, older people will remember where that was. Yeah. Um, and of course, it was a private club that you had to have, I guess, a key or a password or something to enter it. No one really knows how long Mamie and Harry had a relationship. 
or how long they'd been intimate. But Louise and Mamie had been friends up until like January. And then, as Louise testified at trial, they decided not to run around it, not to be friends any longer. She had no desire to be Mamie's friend. So I imagine about that time is when she found out mm -hmm. about the relationship between Mamie and Harry. Um, the trial, like I said, Clarence and Harry, and Harry both were you know, arrested, but Clarence is the only one who went to trial. And it was held in a packed courtroom. It was like a carnival or a festival of something. It was like big news in Logan. People wanted, and of course they didn't have the news like we have today. So they wanted to know what was going on and while it went on. So there was standing room only. People brought picnic baskets to, and stood outside the courthouse for, to hear whatever happened. People were selling drinks. I mean, it was like a, it was like a party, a picnic. Um, Clarence's attorney was C.C. Chambers, who was soon to become Logan's, one of Logan's most respected judges, very well-known man. But there's a little rumor, <laughs> it's not really fact, I won't say it's a fact, but there is a rumor that C.C. Chambers was also the head of the Ku Klux Klan in Logan. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, he, um, the judge was Naaman Jackson. He presided and James Dameron, who uh, was one of West Virginia's most distinguished lawyers and judges was prosecutor. So um, the jury consisted of 12 men, all men, 12 white men. And most of them were Harry's friends or associates. You see a pattern here. <laughs> anyway, um, among others, Jack Thurman, Harry Robertson, Louise Robertson, several deputies, several people, uh, Fanette Jones, and even Clarence Stevenson testified. They all testified. Now, I mentioned Fanette Jones. You think, who the heck is she? Well, she was a, a lady who owned a, quote, boarding house unquote, up on the hill in Logan. And uh, she was a friend of Mamie's, I guess. Uh, in fact, Mamie had taken a set of sheets to her house on Saturday evening before she was murdered. Um, for what reason, I do not know. <laughs> you know sur surmise your own, make your own decision about that. Anyway, um, the only evidence that was really submitted was were bloody rags and a razor that they found in the basement of the Robertson home. Um, and of course the deputies claimed they were hidden. Um, but that's where Clarence shaved. Mm -hmm. And plus he had a nosebleed, constant nosebleed. So yeah, there was probably bloody rags probably all over the house, quite honestly. Um, and like I told you before, Clarence um, drove the car that carried the hounds to the hunting, you know, events that they went to. They had taken the back seat out of, an old, of a car and put a tarp in it so that the dogs would have lots of room to run back there. Well, you know, there was probably blood from animals in that car too. There were a few drops of human blood discovered in the car, but it's back in 31, they didn't have the technology, the science to tell you whose blood that was. They could tell if it was animal or human, and that's all they could tell. So that was pretty much the gist of the evidence. Um, it was determined that Mamie had been shot with a 38 handgun. Um, Clarence owned a gun but it was a 32 Spaniard. Both Harry Robertson and Jack Thurman, her husband, owned a gun and they were both 38s. Um, so it's just, of course, as you know, Clarence Stevenson was found guilty, but there was no eyewitness. There was no proof positive that he did it or that he acted alone. There was really no motive. He liked Mamie. 
But Clarence, who was a poor man with no money or means, he was found guilty and he was sentenced to the West Virginia State Penitentiary, where he became a driver for the warden, a kind of a perk, you know, for some a nobody from Logan, you know. And anyway, he later died there from stomach cancer. Um, who do I think killed Mamie? Um, when I wrote the play, I tried to write it with facts that I had learned, you know, and, and my opinion is that, that who killed her has changed over the years, actually. My first instinct was that Harry and, and maybe Louise killed her. They had their reputations to protect in Logan. I mean, him at the bank, her with the woman's club, you know, they, they, had, they had reason they didn't want any kind of scandal to come out. But um, maybe she, maybe it was because of that. And maybe Louise said, look, Harry, you got to do something. Maybe Louise got in a fight with her. I don't know. Maybe they got, she got shoved down the stairs at their house or something. Anyway, I first thought that. And he did have a gun and he had a car, a way to get rid of the body. So I kind of thought that at first. And then I also think maybe Louise just had had enough. And she got into it personally without Harry even knowing about it and said, look, I'm tired of you fooling around with my husband. And she maybe killed her and then had maybe Clarence help her because Clarence would have done anything for Louise. He lived in their home. He liked them and they liked him. They took care of him. Yeah. But well, nobody really knows. Um, there are stories that um, Mamie attended a house party at their house one evening with several people there. And she got drunk and then she got like belligerent and got in a fight. And there's a story that uh, she accidentally fell and hit her head on the mantle or something. And then, you know, they, to cover it up, they finished her off <laughs> and got rid of the body and then swore everyone there to secrecy. That may be true because it, you can't get people to talk about it. For a lot, for many years, people have tried to get older people that know, that knew something about it or knew something about her. They just won't talk about it. I mean, there's a couple of reasons they won't talk about it, maybe, but that may be one of them, that they were actually eyewitnesses there and they, were, they don't want to get involved. Um, another story is that maybe she uh, was at the Kit Kat Club, the upstairs above the G.C. Murphy, and that she got into a fight with Harry and accidentally fell or got pushed down the stairs there and broke her neck. And then Harry, who had a brother who's a doctor, could have, they said the, the slash from her ear to ear was precisional. It, you know, it wasn't just a ragged cut. It was a, could have been done by scalpel. Um, this is all projecture. <laughs> I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but uh, that's one of the stories that maybe his brother helped him get rid of her. Um, who knows? Um, then there's Jack Thurman, her husband. That's who I think killed her now because he was a county, I mean, a city patrolman who was out every night. And surely he knew what she was doing night after night. Um, he had, you know, she was an attractive woman who attracted attention. And I just can't believe he didn't know what was going on. And maybe he got tired of it. Um, he came home that night around midnight, something like that, because a storm was coming, he said, and he wanted to make sure the windows were closed. She wasn't home. So we went back to work, and then he came back home the next morning, and she still wasn't there. He made a half-hearted attempt at finding her. I think he woke Clarence up or something, and they drove over to Middleburg and looked around, something about a rumor of a party going on over there that night. And anyway, no one had seen her. No one knew where she was. Um, anyway, he comes back home around 10 o'clock and lays down and goes to sleep. <laughs> well, if my, if someone you truly love is missing and you don't know where they are or what's happened to them, how can you just lay down and close your eyes and go to sleep? He was used to being up all night because he worked. That was his job. Yeah. So 
that made it very suspicious to me. And there's there's so many sides to this story. It's crazy. Jack Thurman only made, oh, let me think, what was it? Um, $175 a month as a city patrolman. And after her death, he paid the Harris, which is now Honaker Funeral Home, over $700 for her funeral in cash. Now, where did he get that kind of money? <laughs> I mean, that was a lot of money during the Depression. Yeah. And then he left there and went to Louisville and visited uh, Mamie's siblings who were in a um, orphanage and after she died and he gave them some money so I don't know where he got the money because after she died he was put on half salary until he was eventually not working at all for them for the city um I don't know I, maybe he was innocent too we don't really we won't know but where would he have gotten all that money he later died in an insane asylum in Louisville, Kentucky. Did her murder drive him insane? Was he already mentally ill and dangerously maybe? We'll never know. I was inspired to write this play while working, while volunteering down at the concession stand at the Aracoma Story down at Chief Logan in the amphitheater. And I was working with another board member, Cindy Armstrong, and we were just talking about what kind of shows we would like to see the Come Story do the following season. And she mentioned that her husband, Johnny, uh, has always wanted to see a play about Mamie Thurman, but there wasn't one. And uh, I said, yeah, I would too. That Wow, that's a great idea. I, I joke that she rode home with me that night because I could not get that woman out of my mind. Yeah. And I got on the internet and I tried to find what I could, there was not much on the internet. Um, I read everything I could find about her. I went to the local library. Um, then I went down to the college, the community college and looked at their microfilm files and read, got a lot of information there and started writing play. And then I was lucky enough to see the court transcripts. Um, that answered a lot of questions for me. For instance, um, the bottom line is, I think Clarence Stevenson was railroaded. I think he may have had something to do with helping to get rid of the body, but I do not believe he killed her. I do believe, though, that his testimony sealed his fate. Um, he testified that he had been intimate with Mamie. And in 1932, with a jury of all white men, yeah. that was a death sentence. Yeah. Now, why he wasn't hung? <laughs> I actually, oh, actually, I, he he wasn't even kept in a jail in Logan. He was kept in Williamson, probably for his protection. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, he was, like I said, found guilty and sentenced to prison. He did write his sister a letter while he was in jail and told her that. Um, he would never do anything to hurt the Robertsons, that he could never do anything to hurt them. So did he help them? I don't think he, if he killed her, he did not do it alone. He liked her from all I can tell. And I, I just don't know who did it. Uh, and then of course there's where Mamie's buried, that whole situation. She was buried according to the death certificate at the Logan Memorial Park there in McConnell. Okay. But you can't find a tombstone there that has her name on it. Um, the death certificate says she was buried at, taken to Bradfordsville, Kentucky, but there's no records there either of her body there. Uh, there is a story that a body was brought to the Chauncey the Cemetery at Chauncey and buried. And when the person who was digging the grave said, who is this? They said, it's that so-and-so that was found dead up on Trace Mountain. Now, did they bury an empty casket in Logan Cemetery? 
with all the other good Christian people <laughs> and put her in Chauncey in an unmarked grave? I don't know, but that's, that's one of the stories. Anyway, that's another thing that's Mamie, they say that's why Mamie haunts and is not in, not resting. Her soul is not at rest because she doesn't believe the real person paid for the crime and no one knows where her poor body lies. So that can kind of explain her unrest and sadness. Um, and of course, you know, if you go up to Trace Mountain, or Holden 22 as it's known, there have been lots and lots of reports of people hearing wails and moaning and screaming for justice, they say. Um, there have been reports of men that work there. Um, I heard this one particular story of a man who drove a dozer there and he, every morning, there would be a woman standing in front of his dozer and wouldn't move until he would just about give up and then it was she poof, disappeared. There's stories of a woman in older style clothing hitchhiking on Route 119 now, who goes right, what goes right by there. And people, people pick her up and then drive down the road and poof, she's disappeared. I will say this, and I, um, I have heard that um, people have gone up there, parked their car, mm -hmm taken baby powder and sprinkled it on the windshield and then sit in the car and then handprints will appear on the windshield. Haven't done that myself, but I've heard that that works. And they say, of course, that's Mamie's handprints. Um, one thing I have done, and after I wrote the play, I told my husband, I've got to at least go up there and see if this happens. We went up there, put our car in neutral yep. and it rolled up the hill yep. <laughs> and it really happened. Now, I, maybe it can be scientifically explained. It probably can, but I like to think it was Mamie, to be honest with you, yeah. <laughs> pushing my car and telling me, finish that plague. <laughs> Let's see it. She wants to see it. That's what I want to hope anyway. But, you know, we'll, we'll never really know what happened to, to Mamie um, because people wouldn't talk about it for one thing. And there's too many secrets out there, I guess. Yeah, this definitely sounds like a case of the good old boys um you know the good old boys club covering for each other and throwing it on a fall guy uh, yes that's what i think too especially logan in the 30s um yes you know it's <laughs> harry had a lot of friends <laughs> yeah yeah and you know I'm, I'm sitting here taking notes. I've written a, about a page of notes while you, while you were talking. I'm trying to connect all the dots. I'm no CSI guy, but from the uh, the sounds of it, with all the pieces and the facts that you've uncovered, which, by the way, is amazing. Uh, I watched the play. I've read about Mamie all my life. Uh, my mom and I, we took we took her car and parked it at the foot of the hill and let it roll roll up the hill too you know I, I've, I've always been into, yeah it's creepy as I don't know what but you know what else and it could be my childhood imagination you know getting away from me but I remember getting so freaked out when the car started moving I popped the door open and when the door popped open it stopped rolling and you know I I begged my mom just take me out of there <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? We did it three times. We did it three times because I said, I want, I got out of the car and videoed it <laughs> yes. because I couldn't believe it. It was a weird feeling too, wasn't it? Don't you yes. think? Very, very. Like creepy. I said, it could be scientifically explained possibly, but I'm like, I don't want to think that. I want to think she had something to do with it. <laughs> well, I'm probably going to try it again now. You know, yeah. uh, maybe take my kids up there and let them give it a shot and see how. And see oh yeah, how my goes. grandkids have all been up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, but but listening to everything you had to say and everything that you've uncovered, I'm going to go ahead and throw out a little speculation, and it yeah. might be exactly what happened. It could be the furthest thing from what happened. Who knows? But. What this sounds like to me, Joyce, and I would be a little <laughs> gossip, okay? Yes. <laughs> it sounds to me, because 
having her neck broken, her neck slashed from ear to ear and shot in the head twice with a 38. Um, that sounds like a crime of passion, you yeah. know? Um, there was anger involved. It wasn't just, mm. you know, uh, a fight. Wanting to get rid of it, right. Yeah. I agree. There was some revenge inside there. Um, mm -hmm. It made me think immediately that maybe Jack came home, um, you know, from his route. Maybe he did come home just to see, you know, the windows were shut from the storm and stuff. Maybe he found Mamie was not home, knew where she would be, killed her, and then I don't know how close Harry was to Jack, but maybe he went to Harry for help, and they had Clarence dispose of the body, and, you know, then where all this mysterious money came from, you know, maybe <laughs> Harry... Maybe, maybe, you know, they, they said, I can't be involved and you can't implement me in this. So gave Jack a little hush money, you know, a little something so he could take some time off work. Maybe Clarence got transferred to a different prison and had a job helping the warden as a favor to him for taking the fall, you know, to make it as easy on him as he could. And maybe they traded him not being hung. Yes. You know, seriously. If you do what we say, you will live. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, promising to make it as comfortable as they can, but, yeah, you know, it's either that or we put the whole thing on you and you you get hung. Maybe exactly. it wasn't so much of a choice of helping out. but it's a, And, you know, Jack didn't have a car. Okay, because that was another question. What about his patrol car? I was thinking maybe, but he was didn't have one. walking the streets, huh? He was. That's why he had to wake up Clarence and get permission to use their car. And Clarence drove him over to Middleburg to look for her. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And uh, another thing, um, Harry actually heard when her body was found, mm -hmm. which is, this is the craziest thing. Her body was found that next day. It could have li laid there for a long time. Yeah, especially out there. Luckily, yes, it was found the next day. But mm -hmm. anyway, Jack was at the bank that afternoon around three o'clock uh, where Harry worked <laughs> and Harry got the call about the body. I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I know that 22 Mountain isn't heavily trafficked. I mean, there, there is some, there's some work and stuff out there now, but. 90 years ago, it probably wasn't the easiest place to even go to. It wasn't even a paved road. Right. So who would be out there? Who would think to look out there? Exactly. Um, Supposedly, it was um, a, a deaf mute named Garland Davis found the body. That's convenient. Uh, while he was picking blackberries. <laughs> well, this was June 21st. Blackberries in Logan County aren't ripe in june are they i mean i don't think so. i don't usually see them no. um so that was kind of an odd thing to me too there are so many sides to this story in fact it could have been done she could have been murdered by someone that's not even in the radar mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying it could have been anybody there's another little side note too um she uh was threatening louise that she saw Louise get in a brown car with a man one day and that she had written down the license plate. So is that more reason for Louise to get rid of her? Or maybe it was a totally innocent event. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But wow. <laughs> well. I'm glad to hear you like the play though. Oh yeah, I absolutely love like the play. I love the play. And uh, another thing about 22 Mountain, or that's, oh, yeah. that's what we call it, 22 Mine Road, Trace Mountain, whatever you want to call it. Um, a few years ago, my dad and I decided to do a little stealth camping, and it's probably not the most legal thing to do, to be 100% honest, but we found a place up there at the top of the mountain, you know, there was a little flat, and the trees were spaced out uh -huh. just right, so we decided to do a, a little hammock camping overnight up there. 
I think I've seen photos of that. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have. <laughs> and you know, all night long, we talked about that. You know, pay attention tonight and see if you hear anything. And can we hear Mamie? And we did hear did some. Par we heard some partying going on. And you know, there's a. Oh. There was, you know, beer bottles clanging and you could hear a woman yeah. laughing and stuff like that. But unless Mamie was throwing a party, I, I didn't hear anything up there. <laughs> you probably hear four wheelers nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's such an interesting story. And you're right. Mamie does kind of stick with you. And, you know, people that listen to the show, I hope that they do some of their own research and get into this story because... Outside yeah. of our area, you know, if you if you get out of southern West Virginia, most people won't have heard of Mamie Thurman. And, but this is one of those yeah. true crime murder mysteries that, you know, will never go away here. You know, this is... I don't think so either. Yeah. However, we did have some people from North Carolina who came up specifically to see the play. Really? Who had just heard about it somewhere. I didn't know them. No one knew them. They were just... They like to go to plays and they'd heard about it. So they can, they liked it, they said. Wow. But um, there's just so many sides to this that I would love to hear if somebody knows anything different or new, I would love to hear it yeah. because uh, there could be so much more to it. Well, see, he, he you know, Logan was a hopping town in 1931. Yes, it was. It was a boom town actually in the, in the 20s and uh, the speakeasy was, you know, I had a lot of people, members of that, that were important <laughs> people. Yeah. And, no. and talking about Who the guy. Who would want you to be quiet about stuff. Yeah. And the, the guy that went on to become a judge, and he it's, it's believed that he may have been involved in the Klan. <laughs> you know, it's just, mm -hmm. poor Clarence never stood a chance. You know. No. No, um, he didn't. And I wish that there would be some kind of DNA still around, you know, some blood samples that could be tried now to exonerate him, yeah. you know. But I, I guess the, those days won't come either, you know, so. I imagine not, you know. But I do believe, like I said, if, if he did help, he was, he had to, in other words, to save his life, in my opinion. So, yeah, yeah. He was railroaded. Yeah, I believe you're right. And, and I would just like to state, my name is Joyce Robertson. Um, Harry Robertson is no relation to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> no relation. Just wanted to state that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good cover. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something else I heard. There was a, uh, I think he was the sheriff maybe at the time, or maybe he was just another one of the police officers. There was an, uh, an elderly man who was, he passed away within the last 10 years or so. His name was Harry Dingus. Yes. Um, I think he passed at like 103 or something. Mm. But uh, when he was living in a, I think he was in a nursing home when my, my wife was a nurse there. And she said that he had a story about Mamie, Ooh. but she never got it out of him. You he know, wouldn't she, tell it. He, she didn't get the story, but he knew or alluded that he knew what went on and uh -huh. that's probably the last living witness in my opinion you know that's how everybody was I, that i've talked to that said my grandfather knew this or my grandmother knew this but she never would tell us anything yeah yeah that is wild yeah and <laughs> if, if there's ever a reason to to haunt an area mamie has it you know Especially exactly. if her body wasn't laid to rest properly. Um, my grand, my grandmother, my grandparents are buried up Chauncey, so I'm, I'm really familiar with that cemetery too that you're talking about. And I, I could, I don't know. It's just why would they pay the the funeral home seven hundred dollars? Maybe to have a couple of funerals, <laughs> you know. Uh, An interesting story about her funeral too. You heard it in the play, I'm sure, is that it was packed. The church was absolutely packed. Uh -huh. And uh, it was uh, mostly all women. <laughs> there weren't any men there. <laughs> yeah, I can see uh, that. That's an interesting fact, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of bitter women and uh, yes, guilty yes, men. Yes, who wanted to make sure home. she was gone. <laughs> yeah. 
Wow. You know, she wasn't from Logan. Mamie wasn't from Logan. She came from Kentucky. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think she lived in Logan about eight years, seven that, or eight years. Is that why um, guilt stricken Jack was at an asylum in Kentucky? <laughs> Probably. Yes. They came from Kentucky. Okay. Yeah. And she was Mamie Morrison, by the way. And her father um, built several buildings, I think, in Logan. That's probably how she ended up in Logan. But um, th that's the only um, attachment I can see to Logan is that her father had been there or lived there or worked there or something. Yeah. Because why else would they come all the way out here? Yeah. Wow. Well, Joyce, I really thank you for sharing this story with me. You're absolutely welcome. It's my pleasure. Um, are there any other stories that you want to share? Maybe uh, talk about your upcoming um, play. Oh, my new play? Yeah, your screen. Oh, I would love to talk about my new play. Uh, I've written another. I'm I'm not a, a playwright, or at least I'm, well, I guess I am now, yes, aren't you I? Are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I wrote Mamie, I'd never written any a play before, and I didn't even know the correct format, but I, so I had to learn how to do that too. Um, but after that, since then, I have written a play called Cole, and it's also inspired by true events and takes place in 1921 in Logan. Um, in uh, 1921, Logan County, West Virginia, coal miners were non-union, and they worked long hours in dangerous conditions. They had to buy their own mining supplies. They lived in houses owned by the coal companies. Um, they were paid per mined ton uh, in the coal company currency called script, which they then had to, they could only spend at the coal company's own store. And um, in 1921, in August of 1921, thousands of union miners marched through Boone County on their way through Logan County to Mingo County in an effort to organize them into the union. But first they had to battle the companies hired Baldwin Feltz, detectives, Logan County Sheriff Don Chathan's deputies and volunteers, and even United States federal troops on Blair Mountain. Mm -hmm. This play um, is the poignant story of the Coleman family. Um, Jake, who was a coal miner, a non-union coal miner, um, who mined and struggled to take care of his family. Uh, his son, Matthew, who was just a teenager who wanted to be a union miner. Um, his daughter, Laurel, who worked in a coal company uh, store. And his wife, Opal, who just struggled to take care of the whole family. Um, and she had high hopes and aspirations for all her family. The story tells about their constant suffering and immeasurable determination and unending strength and courage. Um, I'm very proud of this play. Um, it has uh, won second place in West Virginia Writers Contest in 2019. And I'm really, really hoping that we can produce it down at uh, Chief Logan at the Amphitheater this summer, hopefully, because this is the 100th anniversary of Blair Mountain, Battle of Blair Mountain. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of this work because I believe it's local history that needs to be kept alive. I mean, just about everyone in Logan County, Southern West Virginia, has an ancestor or a relative that either worked in the mines or works in the mines. And it's an important piece of history that I think everyone should know. Um, Anyway, I'm proud of it and hope we, we get to produce it soon. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. And congratulations. And I would like to... Congratulations Thank you very on that. Much. That's a major accomplishment, uh, especially I do want... being young and Go ahead. playwriting. You know, you've the second your second swing and you're you're winning awards. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I think it's amazing. These are inspiring stories though. You know, it's an inspirational things going on with people that you you know, you know, so yeah. it made it easy, quite honestly. Yeah. Well, I would like to say, too, that Mamie won uh, West Virginia Broadway World uh, Award for Best Original Play and 
we had an actor, uh, Mitch Vance, who played, who was the narrator, who won Best Actor. So I was very proud of that too. Well, fantastic! And, yes, 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 yes. These plays are, you know, and that's like a popular. Yeah, that, that's a that's a big very deal. Proud. That's a big deal. Oh, and, listen, the the cast around the people in the Aircomes story have talent that is just unbelievable. No kidding. Yeah, very proud of it. Yeah, I agree with you, and I want to just thank you for bringing these local legends and historical events to life, you know, because that's exactly what you've done. Thank you. you. You brought them back to life, and I watched that play. My, like I said, my wife's a tough critic. That was her favorite play, um, and my daughter, she's 16, and I just told her before I come down here, I said, I'm going to go down here and talk about Mamie. And she's like, I did a report on Mamie. <laughs> you know, like she's like, <laughs> she's like excited That's about awesome. this. I am, you know? So, so you're, you're doing a service to everybody here. And I, I really appreciate you. Thank you. I enjoyed this. I enjoy talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Thank I, you both.